very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining me, Matt Stadden. I'm a broadcaster and writer and a regular host here at the How To Academy, although, of course, in these still strange times, I'm actually in my own home in London. I'm so thrilled to introduce to you or reintroduce to you Sir Simon Sharma. I'm not sure he was a, a sir last time I interviewed him. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps you were. I think you were, actually. It's been quite a while. I don't know whether you consider yourself more of a knight these days, Simon, or a professor, but we'll find out. You are famous for so many things. You probably came to wider attention in 1989 with Citizens, your brilliant book about the French Revolution, but you're also famous for the power of art, for the history of Britain. And you are currently a professor of history and art history at Columbia University in New York. You are, I think, in New York State in your beautiful home, which is rather where I'd like to be right now, bird watching you with you in your garden. More on that later. You're an expert in French history and Dutch history and Jewish history. And as I say, in, in the history of art, there is a lot to talk about. We'll try mm. and squeeze in a few Jewish jokes. We might talk mm. a little bit about your cooking, but we've also got to talk about Trump and Brexit, the pandemic. What's 2021 got in store for us and what can we learn from history? So hello, Simon. Hi, hi, Matt. Hi. Very nice to see you, Matt. The first time I interviewed you, I think, was in 2011 for my old BBC series, Five oh, Minutes. Andrew Neil's programme, really. Yeah. Yeah, Wasn't that's it? probably how we got to know each other. But then I stole you from my own series, Five Minutes With, and we had my big alarm clock. Well, oh, that's right. That's right. Well, maybe yeah. there was a little timer in those days. And we were in your, in, in your flat in London. And you described yourself. I, I asked you to describe yourself. And you said that you were impulsive. <laughs> you said that you were irresponsible, imaginative. <laughs> that you were a dreamer, that you were fun-loving, and that in the 18th century sense of the word, you're also a romantic. Do all of these descriptions still stand? Much more so, yes, and much more so. <laughs> I think you've fed me all that stuff, you know. Do you think of yourself as impulsive and irresponsible? Of course, guilty as charged, you know. So, yeah, I think so. I, I, I can't, uh, it's safe to say that if one's supposed to, you know, get more sober, austere, demure, and quiet as one gets older, I'm clearly not getting older, actually. <laughs> the 15 year old is running a muck, I'm afraid, in a very ancient and creaky body. So, so you're, yeah. certainly, you're certainly, certainly fun loving. And in the green room just before this, I'm not sure, and this slightly worries me, I'm not sure I saw much arm waving. But this is one of the things for which you are known. Where are the arms? Yeah, I've got I've magic glued my hands together, actually, so that they <laughs> do this. All this windmill stuff, actually. Um, I, it's totally unfair, much exaggerated. I was looking at people who have been unwindmilled, you know, so like Peston, for example. He's a massive windmiller, actually. <laughs> so somehow I got, I put it all down to anti Semitism, of course. Um, that actually only Jews are uber windmillers, really. So I don't think I'm much of a windmiller. I, I, want, um, to get, I, 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 want, I want to get a brief insight into how on earth you've managed in lockdown. I mean, the Simon Sharma personality is so enormous and you're exploding in all sorts <laughs> of different directions, doing television yeah. usually, doing writing, doing all sorts of things, communicating, telling stories, yeah. rushing around the place, being transatlantic, going and filming the history of Israel, the history of the Jews in Israel, all that sort of stuff, which I think you love. How have, yeah. you, how have you managed, even though you're confined to such beautiful surroundings? Well, I haven't, I think, actually. I mean, I think I've really missed, you know, actual face-to-face -face contact, really. I've discovered something I probably should have known anyway, that in order to concentrate, paradoxically, I need to be incredibly distracted by people though. I need to be, you know, a lot of kind of imaginative writing, whether it's non-factual historical writing or any other kind, it depends for, at least for people like me, not just, not just on reading, though I've done a lot of that, um, but it actually depends on being in the presence of people who are not you, you know. So um, you can phone people up, you can do the kind of Zoom version, but it's not the same actually, because I think when, you know, if you and I were really in my place or your place, all kinds of hints about our face language and our body language would actually feed directly into the conversation and would shoot off at a different angle, but have real kind of human oxygen. And I, I miss that 
really terribly. And I miss Britain, everybody, I, I really do. I know we're gonna have the competition, you know, which side of the Atlantic is more massively screwed, yours or mine? <laughs> this is a combination of horrible absurdity. And I don't know who would win it, not one you would want to win, but I do just miss that, that, that little flat in, in, we won't say where it is, but it's in London. You know, it's amidst the chimney tops of a city. And um, again, something else, the older I get, the more I don't like quiet very much. It freaks me out. I mean, sometimes I like it, sometimes I like it, but I do like the kind of, you know, the throb and hum of, of human and other kinds of traffic too. So that's how when a city- I, mm. When I was doing my, my little bit of research into your answers all those years ago to see whether you changed or not, I'm reassured that you haven't at all. I, I, I sort of tripped up over myself and stumbled across some of the other interviews I was doing with incredible people like Fiona Shaw and Jeanette Winston and, and I mean a whole mix of, of people like Lenny Henry or Jamie Oliver whoever. and you're kind of squashed into these little spaces in those days pre-pandemic of course and you're sitting on a sofa and you're shaking hands you're making physical contact mm -hmm. I wonder how different you think human history might have been if we had been in this perpetual state of basically isolation that we weren't able to physically communicate with each other and be present in each other's lives well it's somewhat a mug's game to do you know counterfactual history but uh, as usual you have a very good point i mean i wrote a piece um which was supposed to be about pretty much exactly that for the ft a long time ago i suppose it feels like a long time ago probably was in the time we thought we'd be out of it in may or early june and it became a piece in the ft about the kind of philosophy of friendship really and that sounds sort of fancy schmancy way of putting it but I thought about you know Horace's poetry for example um, in Latin which which presupposes a beloved friend of either sex really um, to whom he was directly addressing his interior thoughts and I thought about you know Montaigne who go who invents the form of the essay um, goes into just falls off a cliff when Boissy when his best friend Etienne Boissy dies much too young and it forces him literally into a tower to kind of brood mournfully and he worries actually having lost his best friend actually of losing someone else's perspective you know I mean friendships are built on uh, such compatibility that you can finish each other's thoughts or in the case of Jews very often finish their sentences before you have yourself <laughs> But, um, but the other half of friendship, people actually bringing to a, a, a deep friendship something that you don't carry inside yourself is, is really sort of so important. And I can't remember who it was. I think it may still have been Montaigne who said, friendship is really the most virtuous form of social relationship because by definition, you're not in it for yourself. And any society that builds, builds itself um, out of cells of friendship is going to be more virtuous than one that builds itself out of contracts, out of contractual, as we would say in the hideously poisoned epoch of Trump, transactional relationships. It's not an awful word. It makes me come out in a rash as soon as you say it. transactional. We have, to, we have to learn from history, don't we, Simon? How much learning do you think we actually do, though? And as a historian of the slightly more distant past, but yeah. also 20th century Israel, 21st century Israel as well, do you count the last nine months already as history? And should we be learning from what's gone on at the beginning of the pandemic in, 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 in a way that we can better move forward as it continues? Well, if we call what we've what we've been going through and are still really going through um, a history, I, I suppose the thing that immediately comes to mind really is is um, the things that are different. For example, the, at the time of the cholera epidemic in London in the 1830s, or even the Black Death, actually, which invented the quarantine, which turned out to be empirically a sensible thing to do in Milan first and then in then in Venice and then it became a standard way. The extraordinary thing there, so I've just sort of gone from the 19th century unlimited appetite for scientific knowledge, even if at some quarters it was ran up against religious dogma and I think Darwin, but think about that or you think about the Renaissance, early Renaissance appetite for learning 
Um, what's different is deeply dispiriting because the internet, which we thought would be a disseminator of truth and knowledge really, turns out to be instead a perfect nesting place for the rejection of knowledge. Instead, the emotive rush, the kind of adrenaline rush of conspiracy. Someone wrote in, uh, I think it was David Brooks with whom I don't always agree, in the New York Times saying conspiracy theory may right now be the most effective form of collaborative organization there is, which is a terrifying thing. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a, a new congresswoman coming in to, uh, to the House of Representatives in January called Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think from Georgia or South Carolina, who is a totally unrepentant apostle of QAnon, you know, which is a conspiracy theory that believes that Donald Trump is fighting um, uh, against a deep cabal of Satan-driven pedophiles, it's sort of insane. So I'd say what was different now is that, which was even for me a bit of a digression, the internet has, was responsible really for making mask wearing political, for making mask wearing seem to be a conspiracy of the deep state to actually limit your freedom and violate your individual rights. And that had measurable catastrophic effects really on you know, areas of the country that refused either to socially distance or take basic public health precautions. Weirdly, that would not have happened. It didn't happen in the response to cholera. You know, the local authorities cleaned up their sewage pipes and made the difference between life or death. Explain to us then why, why mask wearing has been allowed to be or has been capable of being politicized, given that, as you said in the green room, Americans do stop at, broadly speaking, at, at red lights. They do put on seatbelts. And actually, thinking back to my, my journeys through America over the years, it's actually a, a, a very, in some ways, quite an officious place. I mean, the police, there is a very strong police presence in the state. So why, why this exception then with masks? Well, I think it depends, you know, um, when's the last time you hung around central Nebraska or West Texas, really, actually? I mean, there are large areas of the country in which, you know, the mythology of um, in individual autonomy is a kind of form of religion. It's sort of sacred thing, really. We're all, yeah, weirdly, despite the kind of well-deserved shouty reputation of New York City. New York City is, uh, you know, on the whole, in that sense, very cohesively law-abiding place in terms of respecting, having some considerateness, actually. You may yell at them, but you stop yelling and you, and you make sure you pull up at stop, at stop signs or, or red lights. Um, so there are, that, that's always been the case, that there's been this, on the, if you think about the kind of deep tap roots of American culture, on the one hand, you know, it was a world in which um, the Puritan church could call you to account for whatever transgression picky or serious it deemed, you know, was corrupting the neighborhood or the parish. On the other hand, there is the lonely rancher or the lonely, you know, the lonely farmer really, who's responsible with, with pistols at the ready for his own security, who hunted his own food. So those two, those two types of saying, which is more American, um, living in a group or living essentially with the sanctity of an individual in your family, you know, have been at it. It's it's there, of course, in the in the terrible abrasive debate about gun laws. You know, the, the, the division, which is almost half and half, which reflected in the in the last election, is is between those who read the, the literal text of the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which refers, which begins with saying, a well-regulated militia, then I, then I, the paraphrase being indispensable for the survival of the Republic, the right to bear arms shall not be abridged. And the half of the country, the crucial bit of that sentence is well-regulated. <laughs> and the other half is the right to bear arms, carry and bear arms shall not be abridged. Meaning, you know, you can have it in your pantry next to your peanut butter. You know, and we'll assault back to America specifically, Simon. But just while we're still in the vague territory of the pandemic, I, I, I want to get a sense from you as a historian of what you think the impact of all this will be on us psychologically. Because you're interested in political history, but you're also interested in social history. You're interested in pe yeah. people's history. How do you think this is going to change us and our outlook? in the years to come and do you think it is going to make us more humble so that we can take 
challenges like climate change more seriously? Or do you worry that once the vaccine's up and running, we'll kind of slip back to the, the old normal, which was a destructive normal? It wasn't entirely destructive, I think, actually, you know. Um, but I, I, I would say there's nothing in history. You're asking me to make a prophecy, you know, historians, even me, notoriously bad prophets, actually. But, um, but I, it, it's really I, what I would like to say and what I usually do instinctively say is that I'm not sure it's a matter of humility. It's a matter almost of that our own self-interest is inseparably bound up with our collective self-interest. So, you know, if we want, you've got a house somewhere in Eastern Washington state or something, you really don't want it to burn down or you don't want your insurance to make it prohibitive for you to live there. Same thing if you live in the Everglades or near, you know, the coastal areas of Florida or, or Biloxi, Mississippi or someone like that, that either self, self-interest self will actually lead to a renewed sense of connectedness. And you certainly would have hoped that the pandemic would lead to, and the vaccine that has miraculously been produced, and I do think this probably will happen, will lead to a renewed respect for you know, experts of whom Michael Gove claimed the public had had quite enough. <laughs> Those words we shall not forget for a very long time. So you hope that it will do something to reinstate the authority of knowledge. But what we have going on in this fancy word is a really deep epistemological crisis. In other words, the status of knowledge itself. Um, it's in America, and this is to some extent true in Britain as well, the citadels of knowledge are universities and universities are suspected of being hotbeds of liberal dogma, a kind of echo chamber of intellectual self-righteousness. And sometimes that's not entirely wrong. And it's compounded by the fact that, it, that there are, you know, the safe platform hysteria in universities, which doesn't permit um, speeches which are not to general taste to sort of happen, reinforces the sense that, 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 uh, that academic life or intellectual life or even the life of knowledge is them as in a kind of elite pursuit and homespun knowledge, which comes out of the, the gut and the, and the heart is just as viable and just as worthy. And I was, in America in particular, again, to go back into American history, since you asked me as an historian, revelation has been profoundly important, again, not just for the kind of Puritan origins of America, but the Great Awakening, which was a kind of Methodist and dissenting enlightenment, which took place at the same time as Jefferson was trying to found, actually before Jefferson was trying to found the University of Virginia. So it's a sense really that, um, you know, somehow you can have your own ecstatic epiphany. And the problem is that the ecstatic epiphany first went into mega churches, you know, of thousands and thousands of people. And now you can have a mega church on your very own website. That's the problem. That the problem is, you know, one that you can have instant communication. You can instantly invent your own tribe of shared revelation. And that's that's just where conspiracy theories nest. The difference between evangelical revelation and completely bloody crackpot conspiracy theories is very shadowy. One of the attractive things about you, son, is you're not a Puritan yourself, so... You... No, really? <laughs> <laughs> You've noticed, you're so observant, we've known each other for so long. <laughs> we'll, come in, we'll come on to some of your less Puritan behaviours maybe a little later on, but for the moment I'm just... I, 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 just, I hope not, yeah. I can say that because you use Twitter a lot. You're always, yeah. not always, but you're tweeting away despite being so, so busy. And you're not just a historian, you're not just someone who studies the past, you also study the present. Anyone listening to you speak just now could already understand how intimately you know America. And you look at America partly as an outsider, even though you've lived there for so long. And I wonder how you felt, well, I kind of know how you felt in the build up to this election, and then during those two, three, four, five days when the result was sort of still kind of up in the air. We did a lot of exchanging of, of direct messages and you were telling me why you thought yeah. Arizona would actually go to Biden. In an interview with the FT recently, you said that American democracy was kind of still on the ventilator. Is it still? And how worried are you by Trump's refusal really to accept defeat? Well, I don't think it's making a, nobody in their right mind, I think, actually thinks he's going to be there being inaugurated for a second term on January the 20th. And I don't think he thinks that really. But in terms of its impact on democracy, the fact that the sitting president, the incumbent, 
is, yeah. is making such a fuss about what he's claiming is a lack of democracy. Yeah, well, it's not just fuss, it's profoundly corrosive because actually he's dignifying, again, we get back to the epistemological crisis, he's dignifying a fantasy, really. Uh, and it, uh, and I would say that it's not altogether a surprise that he would cling to a fantasy that a voting system, Dominion voting systems, was made by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Dominion actually has never been anywhere near Venezuela. It was a different firm called Smartmatic, who actually pursued a lawsuit against Hugo Chavez. And Smartmatic and Dominion have never had anything to do with each other. It's just to say that this is the most kind of bizarre fantasy of all, that they somehow rigged the whole tabulating system in order to throw millions of votes Biden's way. You sort of expect that in a way to, you know, it's sort of just as, it's of a piece with Donald Trump constantly voting, uh, boasting about having been awarded Michigan Man of the Year many years ago. Who cares, except there is no such thing as Michigan Man of the Year. What was not expected, what was not expected was that, that these delusions would be so institutionally normalized by a large part of the Republican Party. Um, just in the last few days, you've probably been following, there's a kind of crazed suit being brought, he hopes, before the Supreme Court, a suit by the Attorney General of Texas. Um, I think he's called Dan Paxton, certainly his second name is Paxton, um, which, which claims that Texas has suffered an injury because of the way four other states, Michigan, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, you know, um, <laughs> had their elections. This is just bizarre because actually if anyone's going to be histrionically federalist about the, you know, sacred autonomy of the way states uh, do their business, the way the constitution actually spells it out, it's usually the right wing. So not only is he bringing a suit, but 17 other attorney generals of 17 other states join the suit as amici, as, as um, amicus. And now and half half the Republicans in the House of Representatives have joined it as well. So it's this sense actually of the kind of normalization of the fantasy, um, the ability to give, even after Donald Trump has been, you know, carted out rope to a wheelbarrow um, down Pennsylvania Avenue on January the 20th, that this will be a kind of, we'll have the life that the stab in the back theory had in Germany after the First World War, that there will be not just Donald Trump and his immediate, you know, court, but tens of millions of people who really believe that Trump won the election. But and that, that, that's that precisely it, that tens of millions of people, yeah. because of Trump's microphone and also because of the way conspiracy theories and untruths yeah. mingle and circulate on Twitter and elsewhere, there is yeah. a real risk to stability, isn't there, in America? Because yeah. if you have tens of millions of people who think that they have basically been cheated, yeah. they've been disen disenfranchised, it's a very dangerous thing. And if you then scope out and span out with the camera worldwide, yeah. it's a very worrying thing if the world, yeah, or people, yeah. people, people around the world buy into the conspiracy theory because it gives any sense of moral legitimacy that America may have, and it doesn't have much anymore, it, it, it gives the lie to that. Well, I was thinking a slightly different angle. I agree with everybody you just said, but I think actually worldwide, it makes, you know, for example, it won't make, um, you know, what's his name, the dictator of Belarus, um, Lukashenko, feel more insecure. On the contrary, it will make him feel that, that, you know, remember he said the election which deposed him was rigged and he'd really won it. People like that and those sort of aspirant authoritarians, really, or semi-authoritarians, if that's what Viktor Orban is, rather than a full-up authoritarian, which is probably the right label for him, it makes them confident you know, they will step forward as someone who, you know, laugh in George Orwell's face, as it were, saying, well, you know, we can make people, when we hold up four fingers, we can make them say that they're looking at five fingers. So that is that is sort of deeply troubling. And it's only the other side to inject, you know, just a kind of small mode of happiness and hope is that equally, I wouldn't say equally surprising, but incredibly reassuring um, have been, two 
um, sectors of the American population that have remained absolutely faithful to the constitutional obligations. And many of them have been not just Republicans, but Trump appointees. One is the um, uh, uh, judges, or actually people in the judicial system, who refuse to entertain these spurious um, legal claims that really Giuliani and his crack team have been trying to have just dismissed them and often dismissed them in the most brutal language as frivolous, spurious and specious and so on. So there, that, that very, very important guardrail. And by the way, if it does make it to the Supreme Court, I mean, I think the Supreme Court will not hear this Mashuga totally crackpot case. But if it does, I don't, uh, the, the Supreme Court will rule against it nine to nothing. Um, and the others are election officials too, as well, um, who are under daily, not just trolling, but death threats. You know, Raffensperger and Duncan and Sterling in Georgia, because they are Republicans, are in you know, genuine danger of their lives, I think. And I think I, I what I fear for the next four years, while this kind of poisoned miasma of the stolen election hangs over American political life, is not so much that it will do mortal damage to the Biden administration. I don't think it will, depending particularly on how the Senate runoff happens in Georgia, but it will, it, we will have acts of domestic terrorism, unfortunately. But, you know, they all like to talk about, you know, civil war and so on. One thing you do kind of form an army and kind of march on Congress. No, they're not. But the possibility really of something really horrible taking place in a state capital or something of that kind. I, I fear desperately, actually, the stakes for that happening um, are, are now very, very high. Simon, it's Friday night, you're a Jew, I'm a half Jew. We've, we've, in the past, we've done a, a Jewish joke off on stage. Like there's no such thing as a half Jew, it's like being a half virgin, Matt. So just live with it, will you? Except I think one of the rabbis of Golders Green or the rabbi of Golders Green, Harvey Bolovsky, allowed me to be a half Jew. I think he counted me as part of the flock when I made a documentary of him. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to it. But it is a Friday night. We did What's do it. Half? Jewish... What's again? your other half? Well, not What's non-Jewish. Non-Jewish. <laughs> well, leave it there. Anyway, we did a Jewish joke off on stage at the Sheldonian in, in Oxford in happier times when there were actually audiences. And I think we just take a momentary step back from the serious stuff. We'll return to it in just a second. But I think we need a Jewish joke from you. Oh, well, there is one that actually I was, I remembered that um, because um, uh, wonderful Jonathan Sachs, I was very shocked and upset by his death much too soon. I knew Jonathan as an undergraduate and he was, he was someone often incapable of small talk, but he did, uh, but he loved kind of trivial things and he loved jokes and his books actually are full of jokes. And one very good one involves the Yeshiva University rowing team that is um, that has been picked to row improbably and with not much prospect of success against Harvard. So they send out a scout and the scout comes back and they say, so, so what, what are these Harvard boys like? And the scout said, you'll never believe it. They do everything we don't do. They have eight people rowing and only one shouting instructions. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Swiftly back to the serious stuff. You, you mentioned optimism and just a little bit of hope. How hopeful are you about a Biden administration? Well, it's reinstating those who actually know something about the subject. I mean, already in the in the team that's supposed to manage the pandemic and the, I can't remember her name actually, but very distinguished person has been appointed woman to head the Center for Disease Control, who's a professor of public health uh, at Harvard, I think it is actually. And so that, you know, that I think, I, it, it, you know, it, it, I, I wish I could feel more optimistic about winning those two seats in, in Georgia. But if, if it seems a bit more likely the Democrats don't win it and they don't have control of the Senate, then legislation is going to be tough. McConnell, the, uh, who will still be the majority leader of the Senate, will do what he did. You know, he, he said he was determined to make Obama a one-term president, but he failed at that. But he did manage to block a good deal of legislation, especially after after the Republicans regained the majority in, in 2010. But there is a lot that Joe Biden and his administration can do through executive order. For example, they can reverse quite quickly, not all, but a great deal 
of the damage that um, that the Trump administration did in the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, terrible things. One of the first things that um, the, the two, two earliest things that the, the Trump administration did. One, um, there was a regulation in order which prevented uh, people who'd been um, certifiably um, certifiably identified as mentally troubled me or mentally ill from owning assault weapons <laughs> and actually such was Donald Trump's you know sense of indebtedness to the gun lobby that was I think was the very first thing he did the second thing he did there was a regulation preventing industrial toxic waste from entering riparian systems river systems of flowing water that was the second thing that happened I think during the first week so there are a lot of great a lot of things you can do, um, but the, but the Trump the Trumpies know this. And to give you an example about a, a way in which they've tried to make it difficult, if not impossible, but they think they're wrong about this for Biden reverse. They and something that as a naturalist. By the way, everybody out there, I'm going to do this inter, interrupt the present broadcast to say buy this man's book. He has the most wonderful book of bird photographs. Show it. Come on. Have you got a copy of that? Yeah, I gave it as a present to my wife, and this com combined with lockdown has made birders of us both, particularly my wife, is the, who now you know sends in her records of bird sighting to Cornell Ornithological Center, which is a really wonderful thing. But I was going to say, as a, a naturalist, um, the, there's a proposal um, which has been greenlit to. Um, sell huge tracts of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is the great place, particularly for caribou, but of all kinds of wildlife. It's, it's the last great pristine environment in the whole of continental, certainly USA, and possibly including Canada as well. And what Trump has done actually is um, the, uh, the, the sell off, the auction uh, of large tracts of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge are happening in December. And the issue is whether or not those who win, who have winning bids for these chunks can actually then be deprived of them by the incoming administration or whether they would stand as regular commercial contracts, which uh, presumably could be challenged in court, but it'd be very difficult to do so. So, you know, I want to I want to haul you back to this side of the the the, the Atlantic in just a second. But as a historian, you, you talk about some of the destructive things that Trump has done. Are you frustrated, even notwithstanding the way that he's poisoned, in my view, the public well and, and the, the misogyny and, and the racism and the xenophobia and all of these disastrous things? I mean, he, he didn't wage foreign wars and his defenders will defend him. On, on that basis, but he did terrible damage to the to the body politic, to the rule of law, perhaps certainly to the way that America is perceived. And as you said earlier, he sort of empowers tyrants. Well, I, I, just, I, I, I will try to interrupt you for a second. What a surprise! I'd say in that list of sins, I would say the political colonization of the civil service has been a la Dominic Cummings, since we can make make a transatlantic comparison. Actually, turning very important strategic parts of the civil service, including the State Department, uh, dismissing career civil servants and replacing them with kind of feudal political loyalists been a terrible thing to have happened. And that, I think, could be partly reversed. So go on. Sorry. The conclusion to my question was just that, I mean, yes, you, you have drawn parallels with 1930s, but you want to discourage people from thinking that this is anything like the Third Reich or anything. But yeah. how important is it that we get historical analogies right, do you think, as a historian? Um, because if we get them wrong, that can be quite dangerous, no? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I say this so often, Matt, I guess that um, I don't want to say a lot about it, but it is it is you don't you know, the, what the Third Reich did specifically in the, in the respect of the Shoah was so, and for once one can use the term accurately, uniquely horrifying, really, that you don't, you know, want to um, you don't want to say every kind of two bit hoodlum in power a Duterte, for example, is the Philippines Hitler or Bolsonaro is Brazil's Hitler. It's sort of I hate that really. So uh, a, a lot of the a lot of the um, moral force of history lies in the recognition of its specificity. 
you know, really, I really think that you can say, you know, you can say there are elements of Donald Trump's policy which tend towards fascism. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, for example, his determination, I was just talking about the civil service, but he also, of course, wanted to make the Department of Justice into, in effect, his personal law outfit, you know, to serve his personal interests in the courts. That's a sort of classic example. There's, you know, Masha Gessen and Tim Snyder and all sorts of people of and Ann Applebaum, especially brilliantly and eloquently have, have pointed out. And um, that's we've true. Got to, we've got to learn from history, but we don't want to exaggerate analogies. Yeah. If I bring you back over here to this side of the pond, I mean, you said earlier that there's some sort of perverse competition of who's got it worse. Well, America have got rid of Trump. Yeah. We're just about to Brexit in a real way and very possibly in a no deal way. The last headline I saw before joining you this evening was in the Telegraph and it was, according to Boris Johnson, that a no deal is now very, very likely yeah. or, that a, or that a deal is very, very unlikely. Now- But cheer up, it, it, it's now called an Australian deal. It's exactly, all- Exactly, uh, yeah, which is part a, of the whole whole deception. And, it's all wallabies, and, wallabies and cricket. Yeah. It's not Sunday yet and, and there's still time and you know these, these things can happen at the last minute. First of all, get your prediction hat on again. Do you think we will have a deal? And secondly, how much do you think it, it matters and a, a final chance just to reflect on whether you think that ultimately for all the bad that you believe Brexit has done, is it as big a disaster as people like you have been maintaining for a while? Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't go back on a word of that really. Um, so I'll start with that one. And then I, my hunch is I fear that um, yeah, a no deal will happen. And, um, and I think it'll be a, absolutely terrible thing. I think, uh, you know, th there's, there's issues of short-term chaos, you know, the kind of gigantic queues of lorries on the A2 or the A23 or wherever it is, and, um, all, and food rotting and all that. But that's actually not the, not the most structurally depressing. I mean, we could already see, I can't remember who it was, but it was, do you remember, was it Linford? What was his name? Brexiter's favorite economist, actually. Do you remember his name, Patrick Linford? He, he, he was said, well, but it's the end of the manufacturing sector of the British economy. And he said, uh, he said, well, that's the price you sometimes have to pay. You know, so, I mean, I think, I think that's just a, you know, if that had been put really clearly during either the referendum campaign or during the general election campaign, you might have had a slightly different result. I don't know. Um, but I think it's also, an inc if, we, if we do crash out, as I think will happen, um, and, and I hope, I really hope I'm wrong, um, on, on so-called WTO terms, it's catastrophe for farming in particular. I mean, you immediately, for, the, for our you know, meat exporters will have a 40% up, because the, the WTO tariff is out there, you know exactly what it's gonna be. So they have a 40% tariff on the export of beef and lamb, I think actually. And you know, that's, that, that's a sort of catastrophic thing. Um, and so there are all sorts of sectors of the economy, elements of the service economy really have already kind of, you know, made the change going to Frankfurt and Amsterdam and Paris and Brussels and elsewhere. But of course, actually, you know me, I mean, even though I'm, I put it mildly and not particularly competent to make these macroeconomic judgments, of course, what affects me is the end of the Erasmus program, this terrible shrinkage of cultural horizons. The, you know, it, it, it really upset me. She always upsets me, but Priti Patel crowing about, you know, treating it as a great victory to have the end of freedom of movement. And, you know. So, um, so you, you touched on culture then. You're fascinated by culture. We haven't got anywhere near the history of art yet. But if we leave the politics and the economics to one side for, for a second and focus on what this might do to us culturally. So the, 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 the Brexiters, or many of the Brexiters, some of the Brexiters focused on, on identity, didn't they? That was a key part of why we left. It plays on xenophobic fears and so forth. Not enough perhaps was done on the positive benefits of mingling as different peoples, as different nations. What do you think it will do to us culturally and in terms of our identity, this, this Brexit? Do you think we are going to sort of become cut adrift from, from Europe? Is it going to shape the way we think? Is it going to shape the way we do art? Is it going to change us culturally? I'm not quite that pessimistic, actually. Um, I, I mean, I think I, what I really regret is some things which are measurable, like the, uh, you know, mentioning the Erasmus 
fellowship program that just the possibility of young graduate students going to the European University in Florence or uh, being able to go to Paris or, you know, to do graduate work and working in a different country in the different language. That's really a most awful shrinking of horizons. It's, it's much more measurably catastrophic, actually, for scientific research. My wife's a scientist and, um, you know, she has many friends whose grants depend on European collaboration. The government, you know, piously has said, well, it's going to make up the shortfall that will happen in fundamental places of research, including immunology and epidemiology, of course. Um, you know, Pfizer has happened, of course, you know, in Germany with Turkish, Im Tur Turkish immigrant scientists and so on. So that I think is real shame. What I don't quite think, I don't quite see will happen will be young people or people of any age, you know, um, stopping uh, their interest in European art or European theater or whatever it is. Again, measurably, it's going to be much more difficult um, for orchestras to come to Britain or orchestras to play in Italy or France or for theatre companies. You know, there was a wonderful, um, there, there was a wonderful Shakespeare festival in the year of the anniversary where world companies came to the globe with their own productions. And I suppose it'd be possible for companies from, you know, it's just a shame it couldn't be sort of, it, that it won't be as automatic as it was. But I, I think the thirst for, I suppose the, the, the contrary point to that is that, um, if in fact there is this real, you know, um, real kind of thirst to actually feel yourself culturally part of Europe and and feel at home in other countries' literature, preferably in their in the original language, but if not, certainly in translation. If that had really been the case in Britain, a majority wouldn't have voted for Brexit in the first place, but a majority did. So that clearly was much less important than having a couple of weeks in Ibiza. Just before we, we talk about populism briefly, we're, we're vaguely on the, on the subject of culture and arts. Brian Sewell, the late art critic, once told me that he, he, he didn't have a favourite painting, there's just too many to choose from, but Michelangelo is his favourite artist. Do you have a favourite painting and who is your favourite artist? Oh my God, no, that's so difficult. I mean, I've lived with Rembrandt for so long, you know, poor thing. He's always trying to get rid of me and boot me out, really. He, he's in my bloodstream, really. I mean, I know almost everything he ever did, or with the exception of things that are suddenly discovered, not just the great paintings, but the works on paper as well. So, you know, he's he's like some very bad tempered uncle really who I go and see every so often and he opens the door and says fucking hell not you again you know really actually so um, there's, a little, there's a little bit of Rembrandt in your face Simon with apologies to anyone who's offended by the language someone said by the end of the end of the time I produced my big book on Rembrandt why did I call it Rembrandt's eyes and not Rembrandt's nose since by that time mine and his have become more or less interchangeable which, uh, yeah, if I, I was to say, well, if I to say to you, you, you can have no more history or you can have no more art. What oh. would you say to me? Um, oh, I'd say cremate me tomorrow. <laughs> do you want to be cremated one day? No, actually, I'm not sure I do, actually. I don't, I don't know. I said to my son, you know, we were talking about that. They were, they were indecently eager to know what would happen because I'm here, you know. I, I don't want to die in America. I don't want to sort of stay dead in America. So I said, oh, I want to be, you know, I want to be thrown into the Thames. And Gabriel, bless him, he said, well, that's no good, Dad, because, you know, the wind, you stand on Westminster Bridge and you chuck the ashes and the wind blows it straight back. And I said, I'm not talking about ashes. I said, I want all of me to be thrown into the river because I, my first memory is of the river. And he said, it's illegal, Dad. I said, I don't care. He said, it might hit a tourist boat. I said, no, I still don't care. I'm dead, aren't I? <laughs> and then, little bastard, he came up with a kind of clincher. He said, you're forgetting the Thames Barrage, Dad. He said, you'll end up a Sharma burger somewhere like Tilbury or Leon C or something. I don't know, that's true. I love the idea of a Sharma burger. Hang on, yeah. death, just quickly on death, because obviously we <laughs> think about death a bit, don't we, during the pandemic. Jonathan Miller once told me, the late, great Jonathan Miller, 
who mm. actually coined the phrase Jewish. I think he described himself as <laughs> Jewish. But yeah. He's a wonderful man, Jonathan Miller. But he told me he, wouldn't, he didn't fear death in the sense of dying. He, he feared, if anything, I can't remember, I misquote him. It's there on the internet probably somewhere. But he didn't like the idea of suffering pain. Yeah. Where, where are you on death and the meaning of life and the meaning of death and what, what it's all about? <laughs> um, I, I think it would take, yes, another Monty Python film, really, <laughs> to do that properly. Um, always look on the bright side. Um, no, I think I'm 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 rather with Jonathan, although I'm I'm hoping not necessarily to see him in the great beyond, because <laughs> there's a man who had absolutely no small talk at all, even though he could be very funny. Um, no, I too don't mind being dead. I, it, it's it is indeed the dying, the shrinkage, the uh, yeah, the pain is is um, by definition no fun at all, and you can only remain drunk for so long, really. Um, so no, the dying is is not great, really. But, on, a ha um, on a happier note, before we, I've got one more sort of, one or two more chunky answers, one on populism and one on what perhaps twenty twenty one has in store for us. But just just quickly, cooking. Oh yeah, you're a bit of a master chef, aren't you? No, I wouldn't say I'm. I'm yes, a bit you of are. Yes, you are. <laughs> How do you know? But uh, you no, told I, me. You told me in the past. <laughs> yeah. God, in your old age, you started believing everything I tell you. I do cook an awful lot. I, it has been an incredible joy, actually, joy of cooking. Um, yeah, if, if the book, the famous book of me called The Joy of Cooking in Time of Pandemic, it wouldn't have sold as well. But I find that just because we do, where I live in the middle, in the, in the Low Hudson Valley, we have wonderful local farms. Anybody um, in Britain who thinks so oh, Americans are just slaves to the supermarkets are wrong. There is a great revival in, in local family farms, actually. And so once a week, um, you go to these family farms and you pick up all you need for a week. So that's really from fish to meat to veggies to wonderful bread. Yes, America actually does have wonderful bread. Um, and um, so just, I don't know, this kept me sane cooking, really. I probably, I probably elephantine in extra poundage now, really. But um, cooking, it, it's always, it's the one thing that, you know, you don't have to beat your brains about too much. So it is the great kind of, I, you know, I cook and I listen to music while I'm cooking. Um, I have, and this is, a, to a moment of pure horror movie. I'm occasionally known to dance around the kitchen while actually cooking, which is... <laughs> well, well, hang on a second, because this is again drawing on my reservoir of interviews with you, but you, oh, the dancing. you previously <laughs> described yourself as a mix between John Travolta and David Brent. Yeah, that's true. Are you, now more, Tra are you now more Travolta, given all the practice you've been able to get in during the lockdown? Massively more Travolta, but but the um, the old age pensioner Travolta, actually. So. And as far as music's yeah. concerned, I think you like The Clash, you like indie rock, you, you like CeeLo Green, you like, who else yeah. do you like? Jimi Hendrix, I've, I've even I made notes. I like, I like, you know, Felix Mendelssohn and his pop group as well, actually. Well, I was going to ask you, of the classical... No, Beethoven. Well, Bach, I came, I've always liked Bach, but now I absolutely love Bach. I think I think that happens to an awful lot of people, the unaccompanied um, sonatas, but for violin and cello. I mean, they are, I listen to those all the time, but no, they're not, they're not things to cook to, I have to say. Cooking is often, I don't know, I listen to quite a lot of reggae, actually. Um, yeah. Very good to cook to, actually. And oh. Zouk music, West African Zouk music. That's pretty great. I've been able to jump up and down with hot spoons. To so uh, popular <laughs> music, to populism. Yeah. America seems to have found something of an answer to populism. I don't think we quite have here in Britain, although Keir Starmer to many seems like a, a sensible chap. How does the world, because it, it, we're kind of gripped in this populist wave. You mentioned Bolsonaro and Duterte and Trump and, and, and of course, Putin and others. How, how, what are the answers? Because even, even I mean, even oh. though Trump has been defeated, Trumpism hasn't been totally defeated. And there are tens of millions of people who are not just very upset about the election result, but they're upset about the things that they were upset about before Trump came to power. So what, what answers does Sharma have here? Well, I, it's very tricky. And actually, um, my son-in-law, who worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, made a very, with you know, and was, 
um, is a fierce and clear-eyed forensic analysis of everything that went wrong there. He said to me the other day that only Joe Biden could have beaten Trump, really only Joe Biden, and therefore we owe the removal of Trump actually to Jim Clyburn, the great operator of democratic politics in South Carolina, I think. Was it Georgia? But anyway, in the South, which was South Carolina, because that's what actually got Biden's campaign um, back on the rails. And what, what, what um, you know, um, what my son-in-law meant uh, by that was that, um, you know, Joe Biden has a kind of natural unforced connection with, um, with ordinary people, really, that he's, um, and it was necessary to do that, really, to sort of bring out enough votes, or it, for, particularly in the industrial Midwest, that may well have made the difference. It's also true that, that Donald Trump lost a lot of votes in the suburbs, but there are, there are an awful lot of people in Wisconsin and Michigan um, who, who came out to vote for Biden, who'd come out to vote for Trump um, in 2016. So the, the, that's not a completely satisfactory answer, but we're still struggling. But because the, the problem is that, um, you know, the, the sense of grievance, the sense of actually somehow not having the dignity of the work, particularly manufacturing work, which you're accustomed to, actually cannot empirically be solved by Trump economics. Trump was not really interested in bringing coal mining back because he knew it was impossible. He was interested in actually stoking the grievance that people like Obama and liberal Democrats had been responsible because of overheated environmental concerns for destroying that industry and so on. So, um, you know, it takes the task there in this particular sector is to persuade very large numbers of people that the green economy actually is responsible for, you know, can actually be a place where you can find jobs without needing to go and get a higher degree in, in engineering. That is empirically true. The state which has the highest proportion of its energy supplied by wind turbines is Texas, amazingly. So, you know, there are empirical ways really in which, and also, um, there are far more people involved in sustainable wind energy than there are in coal mining now. So there are ways in which you can do this, but it's somehow, it's a matter of tone. It's a matter of finding tone. It's very difficult because populism above all is a kind of magical thinking. It's not that interested in democratic constitutionalism, actually. It's interested in seeing in a charismatic leader, someone who listens to you you know, Stephen Miller, whoever it was who wrote those early speeches of Trump in the election campaign in 2016, were very clever. You know, they borrowed and perverted the forgotten man trope of FDR in 1932, that Trump would be someone who kind of speaks everybody's own language. And he sort of does in a way. So there is, there is this sense you have to sort of somehow have um, restore trust and faith in a democratically elected leader without making vast majority of people who do not necessarily have degrees, any kind of college degrees, feel they're being condescended to. And that is very, very difficult. Uh, how do you me. make the argument? How, what do you say to someone who says, oh, well, populism is just another word for popularity and Trump was democratically elected, so there. Well, um, he, he kind of lost the popular vote, of course, in America. So the idiosyncrasies of American system producing president. But you, you, um, you know, uh, there's a difference really between objecting to him having become president, whether it's by virtue of populism or popular, you can't really object to that because that's the way the system works. There's a difference between that and objecting to him creating, as we said earlier on, a kind of system of almost feudal personal allegiance, corrupting the civil servants, issuing pardons to indicted criminals, doing all those sorts of things which are fundamentally um, you know, death blows to the viability of a democracy. That one kind, and that, those are the toolbox of populism. You can get away with all these things because you have rallies and you appeal to the ditto heads, the people who simply want to echo your tribal message. Can I just ask, this sounds a strange question, then we'll go to the Q&A, but put into your own words, why you care so passionately about all this stuff. And by all this stuff, I mean the shape of the world, the shape of our societies, you're so engaged with it. 
And for someone who's spent so much time steeped in the past, as I said earlier, you're, you're incredibly involved in the present and you want to make your voice heard. You, you're passionate about it. Why? Well, I was born in 1945, dear Matt, and, you know, there was still, for, in, in my days as a nipper um, and going on, there was still, you know, when that became the Cold War with the possibility of nuclear annihilation, there was a, a sense of the fragility of, of life, actually. And both my mum and dad, you know, noticed, really, they felt there was something... Um, about Churchill, the politician, that was organically connected to Churchill, the historian, the history writer. So one of the first big, you know, uh, sets of books my dad gave me, I suppose, when I was 11 or 12, were Churchill's History of the English-Speaking People. So there was the sense that when you, and this goes all the way back to, God, to Thucydides. I think you and I have had this conversation before. Um, there, were, there are historians who really see I, you know, popular historians who see their work as a sort of stroll down memory lane and those who see it as a kind of world removed. And then there is those historians, whether it was Churchill or my father reading him out to me or, you know, some of the professors I had at Cambridge who believed that to be an historian was a dangerous thing. It was, it, it was, it was to lead the vita activa, as Cicero put it, was to actually, it was an act of citizenship as much as an act of academic research. And I guess, you know, that's, that's the gang I belong to. It's, it's amazing to sort of talk to you, Simon. You're like a sort of, you're like a sort of a, a great sage or a muse. I've never, I, I've done about 80 <laughs> whatever of these events this year, and I'm not sure <laughs> so many people, such a high percentage have stayed right to the end. I mean, we've had about three or four people leave. That's actually post-truth, maybe six. There's a tiny, tiny percentage, and it's because you've got, you're just so buzzing full of ideas, and it's so exciting to talk to you. A few questions from the audience to put it to you in what time remains. Diane wants to know whether you think the psychology of conspiracy theories is the same as the psychology of cults, and also two yeah. parts of one in this question. Do you think that history is cyclical? Oh, cyclical is very difficult. No, I'm not. I'm not sure. I do really. I mean, I think. I think uh, history is kind of oval shaped. That's to say, you know, may have a recurrence of something, but it's squished out of shape. The, the squisher in our own time is, of course, the web, is the internet, really, which makes things possible. But I mean, you could say that, I mean, if you compare what the internet does to what happened when the printing press was invented, you know, from Gutenberg to Caxton to on into the 17th century, the thing about the printing press is it instantly made um printed works available for peer review you know so but what it also did was open up an enormously enlarged reading public um what the internet does is it's made a huge amount of you know incoming meteor shower of information and pseudo information completely indiscriminately scrambled up without peer review that's so that's why the, the cyclical is really squashy oval and you know i'm not sure my metaphor is actually working out here <laughs> the question is conspiracy theories like cults yes that's an easy one to answer yes okay catherine wants to know whether what history or historians will say in 2050 about what she describes as this appalling period and i don't know whether she means populism or the pandemic or both but how do you think we'll look back at, at these these years um how could they have lost their minds, but also marveling that the minds that had not been lost could still produce scientific miracles? And what should we look forward to in 2021? I mean, it perhaps depends on where we are in the world, but you've got one foot on either side of the Atlantic. Is there much room for hope and optimism? Japan's coming back to football grounds, please. You know, there's nothing more depressing than clicking onto a version of Match of the Day with three people shouting at Jose Mourinho, you know. I can't remember whether you're a Spurs fan or an Arsenal fan. <laughs> yes, I'm a sucker for doom. Although, you know, that's on, which? Are you Arsenal or Spurs? I forget. Oh, for God's sake, Spurs. For crying out loud, my dad, you know, used to live right very near White Hart Lane. And he gave me for my sixth birthday present the autographed signatures of the 1950-51 side, which I can recite to you, where Alf Ramsey played, Ramsey, Burgess, Duke, Medley, etc. You know what we say? Yeah, no, I've suffered 
through the extreme unglory years. But I have some of my best friends, as it were, are Arsenal fans. It's very interesting. I have a lot of lovely Guna fans. And during the years when I shouldn't admit this, when Spurs were just unspeakably terrible, and there have been a number of them. I used to, I miss Highbury, actually. I used to go to Highbury and have lunch with all the Gooners. There were other, um, lovely Hunter Davis, who's a great, you know, Spurs chronicler as well as a Spurs fan, used to come as well. And I used to love watching that Arsenal side, you know, Thierry Henry, um, Lundberg and, and the rest of them. I, I thought Monsieur, you know, Arsene was an utter gent and one of the all time great managers. So I always think of Arsenal and Spurs being, um, quarrelling brothers, you know, really, but definitely... But Mourinho um, could be your man. You could win the league this year. And just to end... Ben said, you oh, just jinx it, you know. Oh, well, I know, but I'm not a Spurs fan quite yet, so it doesn't count. Well, no, you and us, are you a gooner? Well, I'm, I'll make this admission, but only because I like you so much, Simon. I started <laughs> off as an Arsenal fan because my oh. next door builder to my parents when I was six told me to support Arsenal. Then oh. peer group pressure, the only peer group pressure I've ever given into at school made me change deceitfully to Tottenham. And then when United started winning, I went to United. But now Tottenham are about to win the league. I might go back to Spurs. Yeah, we'll go together. We'll go and My girlfriend is a Spurs fan. We'll go together. Listen, just a quick question. Build us your perfect day in May next year. Spurs oh, are going to get the trophy, the Premier League trophy at home. What is your perfect yeah. day? Build it around that. Come on. Oh, my God. That's good. One of those, perf one of those beautiful sunlit days and um, I make my scrambled eggs for breakfast, which is very slow. Don't ever cook scrambled eggs in a frying pan, everybody out there. You cook them in a saucepan, low and slow, with quite a lot of milk. And, um, and, uh, and it's a gorgeous thing, and the little pearls of scrambled eggs appear. I take that up with a strong cup of PG tips up on the roof garden, actually, and then inhale London traffic back to its kind of bloody-minded, noisy fury that would be gorgeous. Then walk down to just a particular, you know, have, I don't know, have a walk around West London, maybe walk all the way to Hyde Park. That would be a very nice thing. And then meet friends I love, friends of my heart, who are all really in London um, for supper, whether at their place or going out somewhere and uh, doing a lot of laughing, a lot of laughing. And you're, I, and laugh if, I laugh differently in, in Britain. I Ther really do. So that's such a great line, Simon. Teresa says no milk, I think, in the scrambled eggs. But what's your, what, what is your perfect meal for supper? What would you throw together for supper? If I was doing the supper? Oh God, I mean, I have lots of different things. I made, I mean, well, I mean, it's simple things, very, uh, roast chicken is a wonderful thing. And lately I've been doing, um, I can't remember where I first heard the recipe from, and I do recommend this. Um, I, also, I don't know why everything is low and slow, but very low temperature over four or five hours, but a really, really low temperature. And the chicken is just absolutely gorgeous, stuffed with a bit of parsley and lemon, maybe some garlic and chopped herbs between the skin and the breast and some roast potatoes, that'd be pretty damn good. Eh? Well, Jonathan Miller told me once when we were making this documentary, he said, he said that he didn't really, I think he didn't really like the idea of being called a Renaissance man, but I've always thought it'd be a great compliment. You are definitely a Renaissance man, Simon. You've got so many skills coming out of everywhere. You're exactly. such a great conversationalist. You're, you're, you're great fun to be with. I hope we'll be on stage in the not too distant future that so you can tell any more Jewish jokes. That'd be very nice, yeah. And I should just say this has been a co-pro between How To Academy and 5 by 15. So thank you to both How To and 5 by 15 for thank having us. And well. Thank you to everyone for joining us on this Friday evening. It's been great fun. I hope you're all doing okay and have a wonderful weekend. And Simon, I'm looking forward to hearing more tales of the birds that you see in your back garden. You will, you will. I'll be in touch. I'll be doing... Well, for once, Twitter will live up to its name. <laughs> Tweeter. Lots of love. <laughs> stay well. Stay safe. Bye-bye, dear. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay safe.